Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning and to share God's word with you. Uh, before we continue reading God's word, uh, Exodus 16, just a couple of extra notices to what Chris shared. Uh, you might remember last month um, there was a survey that, that went out about uh, the possibility of a monthly evening service for FCC and also a ladies' Bible study. Um, thank you for all those who responded to that survey. Just to say we haven't forgotten about it. Uh, we're just looking at the results and uh, uh, perhaps after Easter we'll, we'll be looking at uh, perhaps putting those things in place and we'll, we'll give out some more information uh, closer to the time. Um, also, as, as we now have entered the season of Lent, we're looking forward to Easter. Um, I've put together some Lent devotions and there's some hard copies on the, the back there um, on the table and uh, there was an email sent out as well. If, if you'd rather have it in electronic form and uh, you didn't receive an email from me, then come and speak to me afterwards and I can send that out to you. So we're going to carry on reading from Exodus 16, but before we read, uh, let's pray again. Let's ask God to speak to us through his spirit, uh, through his living word. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Exodus 16 from verse 19. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a, a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days are you to gather it but the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the Sabbath day to, to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and it tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years, until they came to a land that was settled, they ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And, I, and this is a passage that teaches us about God's provision. And this morning we're going to learn four things about God's provision. 
And all these things begin with a letter. Now, children, um, us grown-ups aren't always good at remembering things. Uh, we, we forget, because that's what happens when you get old. You start forgetting things. So, children, I want you to, to listen out for these four Gs so that later on, this afternoon, maybe while you're having lunch or, or, or even at, at bedtime, uh, you can tell your grown-up what those four Gs were, because they'll probably have forgotten by later on, okay? But you can remember, so four Gs. And the first G about God's provision is that it is glorious. God's provision is glorious. Verse 7 the Lord says, in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord. Now, this is actually the first time in the Bible that we read that, that statement, the glory of the Lord. Uh, the glory of the Lord is the outshining of God's character. It's God putting himself on display, showing us how great he is. That he is full of love and grace, compassion, kindness, justice, power. So God's glory is really important and it's a theme you can trace through the Bible. But it starts here in Exodus 16. So how is God going to show us his glory? What is he going to do to show us the, the, the outshining of who he is? Well, what does it say? Verse 13, in the morning... There was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. So God's glory is seen in the ordinary provision of daily bread. Every morning when the Israelites go out of their tents and they saw the bread on the ground, the manna, they saw the glory of God each and every day. But this wasn't just ordinary bread, was it? It was extraordinary. It was so extraordinary they had to ask each other, what is it? They'd never seen it before. Provision in our everyday ordinary lives. You know, after a while, this extraordinary provision of manna became ordinary. In fact, if, if you read later on uh, in, in the book of Numbers, the Israelites get fed up of the manna. It's, it's no longer a novelty. They get fed up of eating it every day. They, they say, we never see anything but this manna. We can forget just how glorious God's provision is because we get so used to it, don't we? You know, a loaf of bread to us Seems ordinary. I had toast this morning for breakfast. Got some bread out of a, a bag of King's Mill bread. Pretty ordinary. Put it in the toaster. But you give that loaf of bread to a, a child uh, in Somalia who is starving. That loaf of bread suddenly seems extraordinary. It seems glorious, doesn't it? God's provision is glorious. And we so easily lose sight of it. So let's pray that each day, when you have your lunch, when you have uh, your evening meal, when you have your breakfast tomorrow, that God would show you just the glory of his provision each and every day. So God's provision is glorious, but it's also gracious. That's the next G. It's gracious. Look at verse 8. Moses said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread that you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. So the people are grumbling against God. And how does God respond to his people's grumbling? Does he send a lightning bolt to strike them down? No, he sends bread from heaven. That's how he responds 
to his people's sin, to their grumbling, he pours out his grace. And this grace, uh, in, in terms of God's provision, it, it extends to all people on earth, doesn't it? I mean, it's not just Christians who ate breakfast this morning. People all over the world have been able to eat. They've been able to clothe themselves. They've had homes to live in. God's grace extends to all people. He, he makes his reign uh, to, to shine on the righteous and the, and the unrighteous. His sun to shine. All the bread that they wanted, verse 8. When the people gathered the manna, everyone gathered just as much as they needed. God's provision was right in the middle of the gold or the tent hold because uh, they were in, in tents at the time. Now in Omer, if you look, if you've got a Bible there and you've got a footnote, it's about 1.4 kilograms. And that is the equivalent roughly to a bag of flour. So, that, so there, is a, a, there is a bag of flour's worth of provision for each person in the family every day. That's a generous provision, more than enough for the people. What a generous provider God is. And there's one more thing about God's provision. And I was struggling a bit now <laughs> with the G's. Once I started, I needed to carry on. So this is the last one. God's provision goes on and on. <laughs> it never stops. It kept appearing morning after morning, day after day, morning by morning. New mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. The manna kept going for 40 years. That's just longer than my lifetime. 40 years. It kept going until, verse 35, they came to a land that was settled. Until they came to the border of Canaan. When they could settle down as a, a community, a nation, they could start to sow crops. They didn't need manna anymore. But every day, God's provision kept going. It never ran out. So what is God's provision? Can you help me, children? It is glorious. It is gracious. It's generous. And it goes on and on. There we go. I'll test you on that later on. But you know, God's provision in the desert, in the wilderness, it is just a little taste of something much better and much bigger to come. Uh, th th this provision in the wilderness is a bit like a canopy. You know what a canopy is? If you go to it, you no, know, you don't know what canopies are. Wow. You, you need to ask uh, your parents to take you to a, a, a posh event or a, 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 a wedding reception, maybe. And uh, uh, waiters will come and, and they'll say, would you like a canapé, sir? Would you like a canapé, madam? And it's a little, little um, meal in miniature, a bite-sized meal, like a smoked salmon or, and cream cheese or something like that. But it's just a little taste of what's to come. If all that you were served at a big posh event was canapes, well, you'd be a bit disappointed. But it's just a little taste of something better. The main meal is on its way. And this provision in the desert is just a taste of what is to come. It's pointing us forward to Jesus. Uh, John 6, verse 35. Jesus declared... I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He, he carries on later in that chapter. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat 
and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the world. The Lord Jesus is a gracious, glorious, generous provision. He is glorious. He, he, he is the, the display of all that God is. He is the outshining of God's glory. He is gracious. God's grace has been lavished on us in Christ. And because God has given us his son, he has given us all that we need. He is a generous provision. God gave his one and only son. God did not hold back his best. But he sent Jesus for us. And Jesus, his provision, it goes on and on. His sacrifice for sin is once and for all. It'll never need to be added to, never need to be topped up. And here's another G. Provision. Near the end of Romans 8, uh, the Apostle Paul puts forward an argument. He, he, He says, since God did not spare his own son graciously gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In other words, because God has given us the greatest provision, all lesser provisions, the greatest provision has already been given from heaven. And so we can trust God to give us everything else that we need. So how should we respond to God's provision? Well, we need to trust him. That's the first thing. We need to trust God's provision. If we go back to the start of Exodus 16. The people were grumbling against Moses and Aaron because they didn't trust that God could provide for them. They remembered through rose-tinted glasses All the food they had back in Egypt. Of course, it was never really like that. But they looked back and they they thought, it it was so good in Egypt. And now we're in the desert. And can we really trust God to provide for us? And God's purpose in giving the people daily bread was to test them. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 to 3. He was teaching his people... That man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that is spoken by the Lord. He was teaching his people in the wilderness that they could trust him. They could trust his provision. And that is why I think the Lord commands the people to take enough only for each day. Um, Verse 4 and verse 19. Don't keep it until morning. Every day they had to go out. And collect manna. Not every week, not every month, but every single day. You see, every morning was a test of faith. When they came out of their tent, would the bread be there? It was there yesterday, but will it be there again today? There was a test. Will you trust God's provision today? The Greek philosopher Aristotle, he said, we are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. Our habits shape our beliefs and our behavior. Things that you do regularly shape the person that you are, for good or for bad, depending on what the habit is. And the Lord was teaching his people through this daily habit of collecting bread. He was exercising their faith, teaching them to trust him. That daily habit of of receiving the bread strengthened their faith 
in God. But some of the people developed bad habits, didn't they? What was the bad habits? Well, they kept part of it until morning, verse 20. But by the morning, it, it was full of maggots. It began to smell. They couldn't eat it. So some of them didn't trust. And, and, and why didn't they trust? Well, because they worried instead. They, 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 they fretted. Well, will, the, will it be there tomorrow? Well, just in case it isn't, I'm going to keep some more. We do that, don't we? we? We fall back on our own resources because just in case God doesn't come through for me tomorrow, I've got a bit of my own provision left in reserve. That's not how God wants us to live. We worry when we take our eyes off God and off his provision and we start to look at what we have and what we can do. And, and Jesus makes this link between... Uh, uh, worry and unbelief in Matthew 6. He says, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The pagans run after Heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom to God's provision and not grumbling. I think grumbling is, is just as, uh, he, for the last few months, he's been doing a gratitude challenge. And uh, he has to think of five different things at the end of each day, to give thanks for. And, and he can't repeat it from the previous day. So it's not just you know, five things I gave thanks for, yes, uh, to, to being thankful and, 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 and having gratitude. Um, a website called happierhuman.com had a 30 days of gratitude challenge. Uh, myhealthmatters.com had 31 days uh, for gratitude because obviously most months have 31 days. And there were 46 gratitude challenges waiting for me on Pinterest. I'm not on Pinterest, but if I was, they're there waiting for me. And it made me think, well, if everybody out there is wanting to be thankful to do these gratitude challenges, what is the difference between the gratitude in the world around us and Christian gratitude? Is there a difference? Well, there is. Because the gratitude in the world can only give thanks for what they have. We give thanks for the one who has given us what we have. We don't just give thanks for the gift. We give thanks for the giver. Our gratitude as believers is directed to the Lord. But you know, the opposite is also true. Our grumbling as believers is also directed. Even when we don't uh, explicitly grumble against him, that's where it's going. See, Moses and Aaron God, they, they went to Moses and Aaron and complained. But actually they were grumbling against God. They were saying effectively, Lord, it, it, it's not good enough. Lord, you're not good enough. I'm not happy with, with what the situation I'm in, with what you've given me. And they grumbled against God. Whenever we grumble about something or someone, we're actually grumbling against God. We're revealing our discontent with what God has given us, or with who God has given us, or where God has placed us. So this week... Uh, whenever you feel like grumbling, and, and I'm pretty sure there will be a time this week when you'll feel like grumbling, maybe even later today, why not try and turn that grumbling, in God's help, into gratitude? Two more responses, very briefly, to God's provision. And the next one is rest. Rest rather than relentless activity. When we're not trusting in God for our provision, we find it very hard to rest. We have to work relentlessly to provide for ourselves. But the Lord gave the Israelites a command. He gave them one day a week when they were not to work, when they were not to gather in God's provision. But they were to rest instead. This was another habit 
that God was putting into the, the, the rhythm of, of the life of the community to help build their trust and faith in him. A day of rest. And he enabled them to rest by giving them more manna on the, the previous day, the Friday, so they didn't have to gather any more on the Saturday. You see, rest is an act of faith. Some of the people didn't trust God, so they didn't, they didn't rest. They, they went out and tried to collect the manna, but it wasn't there on the Sabbath. And whenever we rest, whenever we lay aside the, the normal work that we do, it's an act of faith. And we're saying, I, I don't need to join in with the, the, the 24 hour, seven day a week cycle of this world, this, this relentless merry go round that people are on because they're, they're, they're constantly having to work and work and work to provide for themselves. I can get off that merry go round, even if it's just, just for 24 hours, and I can rest because God is providing for me. Yes, I, I might need to work to uh, provide for myself and my family, or maybe I've worked in the past and now I'm, um, I've, I've got a pension. But I'm trusting actually that provision comes from God. I don't need to work all of the hours that, that God gives me. I can rest. I trust God enough to rest. And then finally, uh, the, the final response to God's provision is to remember. And don't forget. Uh, right at the end of this chapter, there is a command to take an omer, uh, a bag's worth of, of, of flour, of manna, and keep it for the generations to come. So they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness. The Lord knew how quickly his people would forget. Even though they've been eating this stuff for 40 years... As soon as they got into the promised land and they didn't need it anymore, he knew that they would forget. And so he gives them a memorial for the generations to come so that the generations to come could actually see the manna. They could see what their ancestors ate for 40 years in the desert. They could see God's provision and believe in him. The Lord has also commanded us to remember and not to forget. He's given us a, a memorial, a meal that, that we eat regularly. He's given us something to see so that we can believe. He give, he's given us bread and wine. He's given us a picture of his provision, his body that he gave for the life of the world. His blood that he shed to cleanse us from our sins so that we remember. And uh, the last slide is uh, an elephant. Um, it's an elephant that we, we met in, in Uganda. And, and we need to be like elephants, don't we? Not goldfish. We need to remember God's provision, especially in those times when maybe we're tempted to doubt if God is going to provide for us. When we're facing a challenge and, and we don't know, will, will he be there for us? Will he come through for us? Maybe tomorrow morning, will he give us what we need? Well, let's remember God's provision. Let's remember those four G's. Have you remembered them? I need to remember it as well, actually. God's provision is glorious. It is gracious. It's generous. And it goes on and on. And don't forget as well the fifth G, the greatest provision, Jesus. Let's pray together. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. We thank you, Father, for your, your great provision that you have given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ.